Good evening, and thank you all for being here. I'm Marta Bazouk. I'm Executive Director of the Holodomor Research and Education Consortium. We're a project of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Alberta with offices in Toronto. Uh, I know we all want to get started and hear our speaker. I, I just have a few comments. It's been 90 years since the Holodomor, and with an anniversary of this magnitude, you can imagine that we began thinking quite some time ago about how to commemorate the victims of the Holodomor in this year. Because with each passing year, it's less about grief and more about marking the resilience of a community that recognizes the dignity of the individuals who perished. But Russia's war on Ukraine has changed everything. Ukrainians again are plunged into grief. Declarations like never again, never again ring hollow. On the one hand, commemorations of the whole of the more pale in importance compared to efforts in defense of Ukraine. At the same time, the war is not contained to the battlefield. There is also a fight for truth and for history. And so perhaps it is more important than ever that we remember and reflect on the Holodomor, that we insist that it be studied and remembered. And HREC has been doing this for 10 years now. The HREC mandate is to promote research and education related to the Holodomor, which we do through a range of initiatives, including publications, many of which you saw out front, conferences, grants, and uh, Frank Sisson will mention our most recent publication. In our 10 years, we've had time to foster the growth of an entirely new field, Holodomor Studies. And we've been able to do that thanks to the generosity of the Temerte Foundation, which funded the establishment of HREC and has supported our work ever since. We've been very fortunate that two years ago, the Paul and Helen Bashutsky family joined the Temerte Foundation in supporting HREC. And we are grateful every day for their support. We would like to thank the sponsors, the co-sponsors of today's event, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress Toronto branch that has co-sponsored that has sponsored this event since the very beginning, the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at the University of Toronto, the Petro Yatsik program for the study of U Ukraine at the University of Toronto, the Canadian Foundation for Ukrainian Studies, and St. Volodymyr Institute. I'd like to welcome our online audience, and in particular, our audience joining us from Edmonton. Thank you, Andrea Kopolek, for organizing the watch event of this lecture from Edmonton. We are grateful to Dean Wood from the Faculty of Arts and all of our colleagues at CUSE for their efforts in commemorating the whole of the more in this 90th anniversary year, and to the U University of Alberta students, staff, and the Edmonton community who have come together for today's lecture. This Toronto annual Ukrainian famine lecture goes back further than HREC. It was initiated in 1998, which makes it 25 years ago. The first lecture was James Mace, familiar to most of you, I think. And past lecturers have included Anna Applebaum, Timothy Snyder, Serhii Plachy. And we have with us two, today, two past lecturers. I think we have Olga Andreevsky in the audience and Frank Sisson. Dr. Sisson is also HREC's academic advisor and heads our, up our academic advisory board, and he will introduce today's speaker. Thank you, and it's uh, very nice to see such a large public in person. Uh, I think we all uh, are slowly getting used to this gathering again, and glad to see so many of you made it out. Uh, I'd also like to point out uh, that uh, one of our next events, we will have a number, but at least one that I want to draw special attention to is the 2023 Volodymyr Delinsky Memorial Lecture. Uh, it will be uh, a lecture called Decisive Terrain, the question of Crimea and its culture in Russia's war against Ukraine. It'll be on December the 7th at 6 p.m. Uh, in this very place. Uh, our lecturer will be Rory Finnan, professor of Ukrainian studies at the University of Cambridge. And we cordially invite you uh, to attend that lecture. Obviously, for contemporary affairs, Crimea is, as we know, so crucial. 
But back to uh, REC and uh, the uh, attempts we have made over the past 10 years to develop Holodomor studies. Uh, I think it is not an exaggeration to say that when we held the first conference here, we had to think long and hard how to gather a group of five very good speakers uh, who would address general topics on the Holodomor. Uh, none of those speakers were terribly young in years. They were my contemporaries, so I can say that. Uh, and uh, we had to think at that point, what was the future going to be? And uh, I think that one of the most important accomplishments of REC over the past 10 years have been we've been able to in some t ways attract and in some ways further the career of younger scholars. Uh, I think in particular are many conferences that have brought, uh, especially brought early career scholars uh, to the conference and then they have gone on and organized themselves and created international networks, uh, have really turned Hello the More Studies uh, from both a word and a field that was barely known to at least uh, a reputable part of the academic community and one that has reached out to many, many fields. Uh, I urge you to look at our publications from the conferences that uh, are on the table where you came in, uh, and I think they will show you that uh, in a number of ways from a study of hunger in communist countries to starvation as a tool uh, and uh, to a conference on genocide we held in 2018, uh, which our current speaker was present. Uh, we have been able to connect uh, all of the war studies to, to many, many fields. Uh, but what I would really think uh, is important is uh, it has taken on a weight and significance of its own. I much recommend you, to you our newest book, Documenting the Famine of 1932-33 in Ukraine, Archival Collections on the Holodomor Outside the Former Soviet Union, edited by Miroslav Shkandri. A fairly esoteric topic and far from one would argue, uh, the general public's interest. A very exciting conference was held in Edmonton on this. Uh, people got together to talk about sources from the Shoah Museum in Los Angeles to what's left of the Japanese archives. They dealt with newspapers from Kanadiski Farmer, uh, the earliest of the Ukrainian newspapers here, to what was being written about in Austria and Germany uh, during that period. Uh, and what I found was uh, particularly uplifting was how much they enjoyed being together and had formed a field. Uh, that is, uh, you could bring together 20 uh, doing research, uh, uh, all related to the whole of the more, it would have been inconceivable a decade earlier. So uh, the book also is interesting and worth looking at as well as many of our other publications. But I think uh, so many of you have come out today uh, because uh, we have a topic uh, that is of both extraordinary importance for the study of the whole of the more, but as well a topic that has uh, become important again, sadly. Our speaker today is Dr. Christina Hoke. She is an assistant professor of conflict management at Kennesaw State University's School of Conflict Management, Peace Building and Development. She is an anthropologist and a scholar practitioner specializing in Ukrainian and Russian relations and in comparative genocide studies. Supported by multi-year national science, Fulbright, USAID fellowships, Christina has conducted field work across 32 locations in Ukraine since 2015, exploring the dynamics and legacy of the Ukrainian Holodomor. Her forthcoming book, 
discusses the Holodomor's impact on modern Ukrainian society, including how diverse modern leaders interpreted this history to predict Russia's modern or current genocidal war and Ukraine's strong resistance. This book is based on her doctoral dissertation, which won the Kellogg Institute for International Studies Distinguished Dissertation in Democracy uh, and Human Rights Award. Christina received her joint PhD in Anthropology and Peace Studies from the University of Notre Dame's Department of Anthropology and the Kroetz Institute for International Studies. She previously served as a US Department of State Policy Advisor for Mass Atrocity Prevention. As a non-resident research fellow at the Marine Corps University and as a US Presidential Management Fellow. She is a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center. Published in 2023, uh, an, ex uh, uh, an expert, expert report, the Russian Federation's Escalating Commission of Genocide in Ukraine, a legal analysis, is her most recent publication, published by the New Lions Institute and the Raul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. I must say that uh, recently I was asked uh, to speak on uh, genocide for a conference of the German-Ukrainian Historical Commission in Wroclaw. It would have been another for me Zoom talk. Uh, uh, and uh, I said, you know, really uh, uh, what I knew is written in the, one of those books you could look out, out there. But if you really want someone exciting to talk about this topic and someone who will add much to your conference, I think I have a candidate for you uh, who will enliven your proceedings but also be able to discuss genocide not only on the topic of the whole of the Moor, which I would have addressed, but on the much more current events. And I'm so pleased that Christina had the energy and oomph to get to Wroclaw and back and teach her classes in, in between uh, and added much to that conference. Uh, she had begun her work already. We cannot claim that we drew her to the field. Uh, as you heard, she began her work in 2015 and she was intrigued, as she told me a little earlier, that she had not known about this. And how could it be that she did not know about the whole of the more such an event could have occurred? Uh, and so she was one of the people who found the topic. But I think we can take a little credit uh, for the contact since then and uh, for her contribution to our uh, whole of the more, uh, for our, to our genocide conference and uh, as well to the projects that REC carries on, including uh, our new plans for an online course, a MOOC course on uh, the Holodomor. Today, she will speak to us from Stalin to, Put on, from Stalin to Putin, analyzing Moscow's genocides 90 years after the Holodomor. Dr. Hawk. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And I'm personally very grateful to Frank Sisson for his leadership in the field for so many years. I'm very grateful to Marta Bazouk, who um, has really made an indescribable impact on my scholarly work, um, and to Harek and to all of the co-sponsors that have gathered us today. When I look at the list of, of co-sponsors for this event, it reminds me that um, the importance of this topic is drawing very diverse corners of the community. And I know online we have um, even more representatives of the human rights field as well. And so I'm, I'm personally very grateful for all of you for coming um, to our online audience as well. I, I know that um, there are other topics that could draw your attention on a stormy night that we're having tonight. Um, I know that it's not always easy to sit down and to engage with the topic of genocide. Um, I feel it's sort of harrowing effect every day. And um, one thing that I keep in my mind is that it is even more harrowing for, for the victims. And so as I begin this talk, I want to just acknowledge what modern Ukrainians are going through today, um, what they'll face when they wake up tomorrow 
tomorrow. Um, I also, before I speak in broader comparative terms, I just want to pay tribute to the impact and the individuality of every life that was lost in the 1930s and today. It's very important that we, that we recognize that individuality before I kind of turn my, my remarks to genocide as a group crime. So I wanted to, to pay tribute to the importance of those lives and those stories um, and those losses tonight. So, um, Wonderful. I've mastered the PowerPoint. We're, we're ready to go. Um, so I, I do thank you for, for coming tonight. And I was really thinking, you know, for, for me, my background is in anthropology. It's in comparative genocide studies. I've had a background that's worked in policy and research. Nowadays, I'm working a lot with, with lawyers. Uh, I started out my career in genocide activism, but how do we begin to grapple with what genocide is? When we, when we keep this word kind of lofty, where we can't quite reach it, we, we miss out on the fact that it's a very human behavior. It's an extreme human behavior. It's an extreme antisocial human behavior, but it is a human behavior. And so I, I wanted just to tell you one story. When I began my interviewing work in Ukraine, when I was asking Ukrainians today about um, why they thought Holodomor was so important for them, I would ask very simple questions. I just wanted to hear them tell me the story of Holodomor. And so one time I sat down in a central Kyiv cafe and I asked, what was the Holodomor, one of my standard questions. And without missing a beat, the Ukrainian I was speaking to said, the Holodomor was when the Ukrainian world was destroyed. And that stuck with me. That quote became actually the title of my doctoral dissertation. And so I've thought a lot about that. What is genocide? Um, what is a genocide? What is the power of its ability to collapse our entire world? And you know, I've, I've written down a few things of what I think that would mean to me. Um, so genocide, um, that collapsing of your social world, that's when everything you take for granted about how a stranger on the street might treat you is suddenly suspect. That is when every part of your identity that you take pride in, that makes you distinct, um, is now something that could make you persecuted, that could make you a threat. And um, a genocide is when every precious family possession, or even in the case of Holodomor, your family memories are suddenly taken from you, stolen by violence. That's what it means when a genocide begins to collapse the world around you. And you know, I can't really tell you my feelings when I was watching last May, three months into Russia's full-scale invasion, um, when I was watching the first um, trial in Kyiv for a 21-year-old Russian sergeant who was found guilty of murdering Katerina Shalipova's 62-year-old civilian husband. He was walking on the road near their village. And you know, I can't really tell you my feelings when I was listening to her speak and she said, I'm quoting her, my husband was a simple farmer, but to me, he was my whole world. And I said, this feeling, this is, this is happening again. This is um, happening in the context of this larger collapse of the social world. But it's also about taking from people, the people that make up their whole world. And so for me, that's why you know, um, genocide is not just a term we debate, even though that's important. It's not just a, a crime that we prosecute, even though that's important. But it really has these deeper social impacts. So tonight, um, to tell you where we're going, there are three topics that I'd like us to address. The first is, what is genocide? Um, it's a deceptively simple question. It is um, something that we, we have in the law. We also have policy based around it. And we, of course, do research on it. But there are differences there. So we'll discuss that. Then, um, you know, this, let's dive into the deep end, as it were. Why is it that genocide, which is, as I said, a very extreme antisocial human behavior, it's considered a pretty rare crime. One of the challenges we have with studying it is that we don't have a plethora of cases to compare. And so why has this rare occurrence um, erupted twice now by Moscow, the sort of same polity against Ukrainians in just 90 years? And then um, I think Marta opened our, our event tonight with such um, powerful words about the importance of Holodomor today. And just in thinking about my work, um, my work in genocide prevention, how can genocide studies help us to not only understand Holodomor, but also help, help us to stop Russia today? 
So that's where we're headed. And um, the, first, the first thing we'll do is go back in time, um, maybe not quite as far back in time as you think, not quite yet to 1932, um, but we'll go back to Nuremberg. This is a picture of the Nuremberg trials. And so as I said, I do want to mention that you know, genocide is something that we have a legal definition for. Many of you know that. Um, but also we have policy that's built around it, and we also have research. And so I kind of want to go through that in turn. Now. Um, if you've really been watching, I think probably everyone in this room has been watching Russia's war against Ukraine since it escalated last year. Like me, you were probably watching before 2022 as well. But what you've probably grown really unfortunately and tragically familiar with are going to be terms like war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. And so I thought it was just kind of important to look at them together. Um, so just to, to point out some of this, the differences and then also what binds them together. So when I use the language of atrocity crimes, I'm using language from the UN from the 2014 atrocity assessment framework. So um, this is UN language. And they, they write in that, in that document about what atrocity crimes, all three of these, what they have in common. And I'm quoting them now. They say that atrocity crimes together, this kind of package of heinous human behavior, are the most serious crimes against humankind. They harm the core dignity of human beings, in particular the persons that should be most protected by the state. And so there's differences here. So for example, war crimes, I put up very short definitions just to sort of orient us, but war crimes, for example, take place exclusively in context of armed conflict. Crimes against humanity can take place in either conditions of war or in times of peace. Um, so you also will see differences with crimes against humanity has a list of acts, but the, the last part of its definition there says other inhumane acts. So that's in comparison to genocide, which I'll put up in a minute, but genocide has a very clear five prohibited acts. And then with crimes against humanity, when compared to genocide, um, you will see with crimes against humanity that there is no need in the law to establish an intent. It's just about the acts that are happening happening. And with genocide, it's about the acts that are happening as well as the intent behind them. Um, without getting too technical here, I just also wanted to point out something that um, I know I sometimes take for granted, and I wanted to point out the dates. <clears throat> so when you look at it, genocide is actually the oldest term here. Um, and there's a lot we can critique about the, the UN Genocide Convention. I'll be mentioning a bit of that tonight. I won't let that off the hook. But I do think that it's also important to acknowledge its really foundational role in international human rights. So genocide, as my last slide showed, was adapted in 1948. And the full name, it's important. It's worth saying. So it's probably the only time I'll say it tonight. But um, the Genocide Convention is actually called the UN Convention on the Prevention and the Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. So those those two aspects were codified into law right from the start. And what I find truly a little bit miraculous is that it is a legal category that has been ratified or acceded by 153 countries around the world. I would point out that that includes the Russian Federation. Um, but I would invite you to think with me for a minute um, about what that means. So when it's ratified or acceded, that doesn't just mean that we've got another resolution in the UN General Assembly. But it means that 153 countries have taken steps to put that law into their own domestic legal processes. They've bound themselves with certain legal obligations to it. And that is really important. I'd like us to think about, is there any issue today that you think 153 countries would not just write a resolution on, but would actually bring into their own domestic um, legal processes as well? And so in some ways, the Genocide Convention, with all of its limitations, is a little bit, I think, of a miracle. Um, and um, someone like me is often trying to point out for broader audiences, today when we talk about Russia's war against Ukraine is undermining the international rules-based order that can sound so technocratic, but it's really about these foundational things that a lot of um, political, economic, legal, all of these things rest upon this kind of delicate architecture. And I would say the Genocide Convention is one of them. Um, if you have an idea of what could get 153 countries today to ratify a legal document, I'd love to know. And so, um, you know, the Genocide Convention in this light has been rightly credited with pioneering the development of both international criminal law and with international human rights. 
So before I go on, um, it is worth, I know many of you probably look at this, but it is worth just putting up for a minute, um, and then I'll try to be a little bit less technical from here on out, I promise. But there's a couple of things that sometimes I get questions, really good questions about. And um, we'll start with Article 3. I've just pulled part of the, the definitional language out. <clears throat> Something that I get asked a lot um, is, you know, genocide is prohibited, right? Yes, but as you can see, there's actually four other variants of that behavior that are also um, a part of this, of this legal language that are also punishable. So it's not just genocide, but it's also the conspiracy to commit genocide. It's also about the direct and public incitement to commit genocide. It's also about the attempt to commit genocide and complicity in genocide. And so I've highlighted direct and public incitement along with genocide itself, what I would call the commission of genocide in A, because I'm working on that issue with, with a wonderful group of colleagues today. Um, so, so it's not just you know, wrong or not nice or rude to say these kind of inciting language that we're often hearing from Russian state actors. It's actually a crime with no statute of limitations. And that does become quite important. Last year, last fall, we had um, a prosecution begin of a, of a propagandist from Rwanda 18 years um, after he committed the crime. It doesn't have a statute of limitations. And so th what, what this convention actually prohibits is quite important. It's a bit broader in some ways than, than what we might think of at first. On the other hand, what is genocide? Um, and so I've just bolded a few things. This will come out um, in my talks tonight. So I think it's kind of important to know, as much as the Genocide Convention itself was a political process, we started out in the field of genocide studies with legislation and from there developed scholarship and developed policy. So it really was, um, you know, we had to deal with the legal language first. We had to know what it says before we could critique it. And so when, when um, the convention is talking about genocide, I'll point out it'll become important important later on, this is foreshadowing, um, but I'll point out that it's any of these five acts are, are, can be considered genocidal acts. However, to be considered genocide, it's the acts plus the intent. So the intent to destroy in whole or in part, and it's along these, these groups here, which are protected, include national, ethnical, racial, or religious. So one of my colleagues, for example, has said that two of those groups, um, ethnic and racial, that's really about what you're, you're born as, um, and parts of your identity that you're born with, and maybe religious and national can be parts of your identity that you choose. Um, sometimes you're born, but that also you choose. And you know, I know that a lot of people in this room have also talked about this convention as a political process, the role of the Soviet delegation in narrowing these confines of group language. Um, but still, it's in looking at what we have today. So um, the work that I do is often looking at the protection of the Ukrainian national group today. Um, so I think you've survived the most technical part of my talk. Um, but it's important to sort of know what we were working with. So, so that was the, the legal definition of genocide, as I said, worthy of critique, yet also a miracle, yet also the kind of linchpin of international human rights today. Um, very, very important. So um, when we, we take that law, we then have to translate it both in policy. So um, you know, law, I think, is about getting perpetrators in the courtroom, and that's important. It's undeniably important. It's irreplaceable. But I would say that that fulfills the UN Convention part on the punishment of the crime. But what about the prevention? Um, seems just as important. In fact, as I, I say that every time I get a microphone, I like to say that the central duty of the Genocide Convention is the prevention of genocide. So that's really where policy and research can also come into play. Policy, those decision makers who, who work to stop it, as well as research. So we looked at it in its broader, broader perspective. We're not often bound by the politicking of the convention. We can look more broadly at groups. And that's what my work has done. So when we're, when we're looking at genocide, I think it's important to look at its place in international human rights and also look at its place in history. Um, you know, the, the shocking nature of, of the first prosecution of genocide against more than six million Jews and other populations. Um, and it has, it has caused this term to have this important moral authority. Um, also at that time, we were seeing things like the role of industry and technology, not just used for human progress, but used to speed up the Nazis' killing machine and, and speed up their killing efficiency. 
And then also the role of the mass media. So that was something that was new right around this time. So you had both um, footage from the liberation of concentration camps as well as the courtroom proceedings later being streamed into everyday homes. And so that's, that's shaped how people think about genocide in ways that are really important. It is something I think that we should um, have moral stake in. Um, but we also needed to, to take some steps forward to think about how we translate that into research. And that's where you know, the, the question gets broader. Um, so when, when I'm working with lawyers sometimes, um, you know, they work a lot with jurisprudence, and it's so important what they do. Um, but they, they are sort of looking like, what happened in the past? What's precedent? And with research, it's a little bit about where do, where do we want to push the field forward in order to sort of better grapple with the truth or the reality that we're seeing. And so in research, um, that has led to a lot of definitional debates that we have debated just in this room back in 2018 when we had a conference here. So my colleague Adam Jones, for example, in his wonderful introductory book on genocide that I use a lot with students, has 25 different academic definitions of genocide where um, you know, they sort of work to grapple with the fact that the legal definition I showed you is a political um, document or that, that said, for example, that you know you had to either have the, the definition wider to protect a wider number of groups, or maybe we should keep it narrow because if not, it loses all kind of conceptual clearance. So the, the field of research, of translating a legal definition into research is a lot um, more fraught and technical um, than one would think, but it matters. Um, it matters because really it was about this research of feeding into policy. How can we stop it? How can we stop it better? And so finally, there are a few colleagues of mine in the field who kind of said, okay, do we agree on anything? We have had all these definitional debates. Do we agree on anything? And the good news is we do. We, find, we found two areas that we as genocide scholars really agree that sets genocide apart um, as a crime that, that helps us recognize it in real time, not just after the fact when it's prosecuted, but in real time so that we might stop it. So with that, there were these two kind of core questions that genocide scholars agreed on. The two core questions were asking questions of who is targeted? Is it a whole group? Is it, is it actually a group that's being targeted? Or is it a subset of a group? Um, for example, one of the heartbreaking things about my work is seeing a lot of targeting of teenage boys globally. Teenage boys are often viewed as future combatants. And so unfortunately, they're targeted in lots of different violence. With genocide, you're looking for a kind of broader aim to target a group. Um, and then we also looked at for what purpose. So there are lots of types of violence, unfortunately, and morally I care about all of them, as I'm sure you do, but we were trying to understand the differences between these types of violence so that we could diagnose them and then stop them in, in more specificity. So with genocide, it's not just about repressing a group or harming a group or intimidating a group or injuring a group. All of that is a different type of violence. Genocide has this inherently destructive intent. And because of that, genocide is really often, you know, they say like it takes a village. Well, in genocide, it really does take a lot of different actors to carry that out. So with um, a, a violence, an act of violence where, let's say you're just trying to intimidate a group, a perpetrator can run in there, throw a bomb in a marketplace, and run away and have a low likelihood of getting caught. They've scared the people they're trying to terrorize, and they can run away. But if that perpetrator is not just trying to terrorize, to repress, to harm, then they're going to have to go to a lot more effort. They're going to have to somehow get the people they're targeting together. They're going to have to have a lot more coordination. They're probably going to chase their victims. Um, we see population um, efforts to control the population is really central. So genocide takes a lot more effort. Um, all of those efforts used for human, for human evil, it's really a sobering thing. And so that was really, when I, when I first started studying Holodomor, those were the type of questions, you know, do we see evidence of, of not just trying to intimidate, to harm, to repress, but do we see evidence both, you know, as my lecture title alludes, of st for Stalin and then Putin aiming for this destructive violence, going to a lot more effort. Um, and so 
This is, um, I'm really indebted to some of the historians that are in this room, I, I'm seeing some of you, um, of working with the, the historical reconstructive works that they did. Um, and when I approached the case of the Holodomor, it was about taking some of those historiographies, looking at the documents myself, and then grappling with what we know about other genocides. So you run into other issues when you're studying genocides. For example, you're dealing with pretty hardened perpetrators. They've decided to destroy a group and they're often kind of at the top of their power, so they don't really feel the need to justify themselves to, the, to their subordinates. They're probably not going to write down um, exactly, I am trying to threaten this group for the purpose of destruction. So we, we use these kind of proxy indicators. We look really closely at how perpetrators talk about a future with their victims. Do they in, imagine them existing at all, even if they're imagining them repressed or harmed, or do they talk about them as no longer existing? Of, um, and so that becomes quite important. And so um, with Holodomor, those were some of the patterns that just really began to jump out to me. I know I'm speaking to a really knowledgeable audience, but I also know that we have um, some of the more global human rights community joining us online. So I'll just mention a few things that a lot of you know about Holodomor specifically, but that really jumped out to me with the background that I was coming from. So um, first of all, you know, genocide is not about numbers, but it was striking to me, like very, very shocking how many people were killed so quickly. I know one of the past famine lectures, Serhii Plohi, has talked about um, one in every eighth person in Ukraine perishing in just those two years. Um, and also, we were, we, I was really noticing very specific parts of the case. So it wasn't just about taking people's food. That's, that's a heinous thing to do, first of all. But it was also about taking their equipment and their seeds. And so it wasn't just really pushing them down for this year, but it was destroying that, that future possibility of them to recover as well. Um, we were, when I was looking at the case, we were also looking at um, evidence of the, the infamous blackboards or the pursuit of peasants, um, bringing them back into their village. Things like that became very significant. So if you begin to think about what a perpetrator is trying to do through these things, the pursuit or the population control of their victims becomes really important. And it, it's something that I'm, I want to sit on for just a minute with you because it's something that, that I see um, back then. This is just an example picture, by the way, the black and white one. I, I haven't verified it, but just to give us an example of what that might have looked like. And then, of course, this is um, from today, from the Associated Press. But I, I began to see, when I was looking at the Holodomor records, that there was this pursuit of the victims. It's really quite clear in the documents. It's in black and white. They kept track of who they were pursuing, where, of where they were taking them back. And you know, I want to point out what's going on there. Because if you look at it with this sort of cold logic of a perpetrator, um, why are they going to such great effort to chase those people and bring them back if it was about just stealing their land, just stealing um, the, the food or the equipment or things like that, then actually driving them away would have been the sort of easy route. Um, the, the people would have fled and you can steal all of their things and you can have their land. But when you begin to see perpetrators going to greater effort to pursue victims, then you begin to see that you know it's actually not just about these physical objects, it's about the people. Um, and so that is something we see both then and today. And also another thing that, that really struck me in these documents is the way that, that um, the category of Ukraine was different in the 1930s today, but the kind of commonality was the way that the, the future was talked about. And I'm gonna come back to that. Um, but the, this idea of you know, perpetrators always decide for themselves how they, view, how they view the targeted victim group, but it was about you know, um, really saying that uh, Ukrainians were no longer reasonable or that um, they, were, they couldn't be made into good communists at the time or good Russians today. And so it was this escalating view in both the documents of the past and the language I see today um, about the, the targeting of this entire group of people that it became not just kind of, you know, this person is bothering me, but this kind of unqualified portrayal of what it meant to be Ukrainian then and now. So, um, you know, I, I, I really thought um, a lot about 
what this case can tell us, um, what lessons we can learn. So I think that it is really important to commemorate, just because we have the war going on right now, I think it is so important to honor 90 years since this hap has happened. But I also um, want to point out, I'll just skip ahead for a minute, that, that there are some lessons that we can learn from, from the Holodomor. And um, one of the reasons that I think it's, it's really important to, to take a look at this case is to think about the kind of durability of some of these dynamics, of some of these, this ideology of destruction, this ideology of Ukrainianness as somehow threatening the polity in Moscow, either during collectivization or today um, with Ukraine's sort of economic inclination in 2013 and 14 to Europe. And um, the durability of these dynamics, I think, is you know, what has led to some of the incredibly prescient examples um, of, of what Ukrainians were telling me when I was doing my researching. And so this painting um, that I put here, it's called Open Wounds May Heal. And I thought a lot about that. And so um, you know, obviously there's this connotation there of coming to terms with a topic that was long suppressed. But if I put this in its immediate context today, I think one of the lessons that we can learn is, is articulated by, by Jana Hrinko, an interview that I did. And I'm going to take the time to actually read this to you so you don't have to, to read it because it's so important. And the first thing I want us to point out is look at the date on this. Look at the date, and then here's what she said. She said, I am a child of independent Ukraine. When Yanukovych um, escaped, that is, he fled to Russia, the former president, it was so unexpected. And this Russian occupation of Crimea and the war in Donbass, eastern Ukraine, were so unexpected for me. But when I remembered the history of the Holodomor, I understood that Ukrainians should have foreseen this. What is now happening in Donbass and in Crimea is not the end of Russian encroachment towards Ukraine. Nowadays, the Russian president denies the fact that the Holodomor is genocide. Actually, he denies the existence of the Ukrainian nation as such. We all understand that the Holodomor occurred because Soviet authorities were afraid to lose Ukraine. They did not want it to stop being part of the Soviet Union. Russia's president denies the existence of the Ukrainian modern state. They are constantly trying to take away our history. Such attempts to take away our history are very dangerous because in this case, we have a situation where one identity is put onto another identity, and as a result, one identity assimilates to the other one. We have to stand our ground. We do not have the right to forget about the Holodomor because it will take us to another genocide. Um, and I've really thought, and I've talked with Yana a long time in the, the years that have passed um, since she said this, and I think it was this durability of these kind of the, the history change, the context change, the leaders change, but this durability of some of these dynamics that helped Yana to see clearly. And I, I was thinking about I was thinking about this interview the day that um, you know we, we saw you know in Mariupol still occupied today, just seeing horrific violence, and you know we we heard of course um, very extremely dubious claims of Russian claims of saving the city, and so when they finally take control, what do they do? Do they deal in any way with the violence, the devastation, the humanitarian crisis that they inflicted on the city? No, they began to cover up Ukrainian identity. They began to paint street signs and make minuscule changes um, in the language. And then, of course, they would ultimately um, tear down the, the Holodomor monument in that city and, as far as we know, redirect those materials to reconstruction. So covering up a crime that, that Moscow had committed in the past, using those materials to try and cover up a crime they could, had committed in the present. And so when I look at what Yana said, when I look at her looking at the durability of these dynamics that, that we need to come to terms with, um, of course, I also think of Raphael Lemkin. It's really worth looking at the speech, which was found by um, a member of, of this group in the archives. And so, you know, just reading this, going back even farther than Yana's interview, when I want to speak about is perhaps the classic example of Soviet genocide, its longest and broadest experiment in Russification, the destruction of the Ukrainian nation. As long as Ukraine retains its national identity, as long as people consider, continue to think of themselves as Ukrainian and to seek independence, so long, Ukraine poses a serious threat to the very heart of Sovietism. It is no wonder that the communist leaders have attached the greatest importance to the russification of the independent-minded member of their union of republics um, and have determined to make it fit their pattern of one Russian nation. For the Ukrainian
Ukrainian is not and has never been a Russian. His culture, his temperament, his language, his religion, these are all different. And I think that even with modern Ukraine's transition to a political nation, this distinction of their brittle and autocratic neighbor next door to the increasingly pluralism and very free Ukraine today was again posing a threat to the regime next door. So when we look at these, when we see the kind of durability of these dynamics, I think it does add um, real urgency to breaking these dynamics today. And I think that's why you have me, I think about you know former lecturer um, before me, Timothy Snyder, others who I think we'd probably prefer to be writing, but instead we're sort of out there calling for, for aid to Ukraine, military aid, defensive aid. And it's because of the durability of these dynamics if you know the relationship here. So as I kind of, um, I want to conclude my remarks um, over the next 20 minutes. It's a very long conclusion, but the final thing I want to talk about is just four kind of lessons that I think we can learn from Holodomor and how they can help us stop Russia today. <clears throat> So I'll give you kind of the overview. We're gonna talk a little bit about the perpetrator logics, the perpetrator intentions, the perpetrator networks, and then the outcome. So first of all, I'll kind of explain this picture. It's blurry, um, and it's blurry because um, this was posted on, on Facebook um, by Victoria Amelina, who's now passed away in, in a missile attack. She was murdered. Um, and I, when I looked at this picture when she posted it before her death, I thought, you know, it's so unusual to have such a visual representation for me of this complex phenomenon of genocide. And here's what I mean. This is the Victory Cinema. It's in Bakhmut. And the first picture is, of course, um, a community gathering of some kind kind of showing their connection to their heritage, to their identity, um, to a lot of differences up there. And you can also see what's not just showy in this picture, are these beautiful costumes, but if we think about what's implicit, it's community relationships, it's community gatherings, it's all of the unspoken social norms and social cues that made these people a community. And then we look at what Russia has done to the same place today, and they've done it through violence, but it's not just about destroying um, the cinema, it's about destroying this community and all of those features of their identity that should bring them pride and that they should have the safety and the freedom to express. And so that gives us a kind of a visual representation of what um, a perpetrator logic is during genocide. And um, I'm really delighted that I'm, I'm currently writing with Daria Mattingly, who perhaps you saw her lecture last year when she did this lecture. And so we've been talking a lot about empire. And I think like the term genocide, it can just feel so distant or it can feel a little esoteric, but really it's about human behavior. And so, you know, thinking about her own work and thinking about our work together, we've been talking about the logic of empire is treating people as resources. Um, <clears throat> I think that we saw that with collectivization, certainly. We also see it today with Russian military tactics. And unfortunately, I would say that we see that with modern Russian society today. I remember she said last year, she said, I think that it's people behave as what they know. And, and the modern Russian state hasn't grappled with um, that reality that, that their system is treating them as if they are not individuals, but as if they are resources. And so I think that that is, is really what we saw first um, in Holodomor and that we see today. And you know, I'm looking here, I put some, some <laughs> as one does, some quotes from the records I looked at from August 11th, 1932. This is Stalin himself saying, you know, set yourself the goal of turning Ukraine into a fortress, a real model republic, so this transformation. Um, I'm, do, it, do it or we will lose Ukraine. And so it's this idea of, of the forcible erasure of what made Ukraine Ukraine, Ukraine, its authentic identity representations, and erasing all of that and turning it into something that it's not, because it's not actually transforming, right? It's actually suppressing people's identity and forcing them to behave as if they were something different. And when I look at that, you know, I look at a lot of this really horrendous, inciting language that we've, that we've documented in all of these legal reports that I do today. And I look at one who said, you know, that Ukrainians are, quote, Russian people possessed by the devil were coming 
coming to convince them not to kill them. But if you don't change your minds, then we will kill you. We'll kill as many of you as we have to. We'll kill either one million or five million. We'll exterminate all of you until you understand that you're possessed and have to be cured. And so when we look at what transformation actually means, it's that. It's what this picture is showing. It's, it's not encouraging people to a debate. It's, it's trying to, to wield violence against them, to suppress who they are, to erase, to annihilate who they are um, in these ways. And so we have to kind of grapple with that. And you know, I've been having a lot of talks with um, Ukrainian colleagues about that, and I think this logic of, of treating people as resources is one thing, but we also have to really grapple with um, perpetrator intentions. And um, this is, is really quite grim, but we, we need to face it. And I think a lot of us in this room are facing it, and so we'll just continue that process of causing others um, in the world to face what's going on. So I wanted to point out that the, the beautiful graphic poster was designed by uh, my colleague, um, Yulia Fedorovich, she was a Fulbright, um, doing the Fulbright student program to the University of Notre Dame, and so she had made this and gave me permission to use it. And so um, she's just pointing out how many Ukrainians were dying every, every three days in that late spring. And you know, we hear like a stadium full, and it's already kind of shocking and boggling the mind. But I put up a picture of the stadium she was referring to, and that's every three days. Um, and so facing these realities of what these intentions are, um, how far perpetrators can be willing to go, I want to point out something that was very, very sobering for me as we put together, um, let's zoom on ahead and just show you, this is one of the legal reports that, that I was a part of. I was the principal author on this report, working with a number of wonderful colleagues, a great team. And so when today we were looking at um, what was happening, the first report we issued in May 2022, and the second report we issued 14 months later, and what was incredibly sobering was finding a consistent pattern of not just genocidal incitement, as we say, or the commission of genocide, but, to, but finding this overall pattern of escalation in both language and in actions. So not just um, continuing to kind of incite with genocidal rhetoric against Ukrainians, but introducing new tropes. So some of you might remember the trope of you, Russia was supposedly no longer denazifying Ukraine, but was desatanizing Ukraine, just sort of trying to go as far up the dehumanizing escalation ladder as you can. That was introduced last fall, um, so well into the full-scale invasion. Then we were also looking at this pattern of, of escalation of the commission of genocide. And for me, um, having worked on a, a lot of cases that are all very important to me, something that was very rare for us was that we found a pattern of atrocities. I, I told you how important that is, a pattern of atrocities from which an inference of intent to destroy the Ukrainian national group in part could be drawn. But what we also found, the language here says one or more, but what we actually found when you read this kind of 60 pages document, we found all five prohibited um, acts. So we found what you might think of as the five spokes of genocide, evidence of all of those. And that's very rare. Um, and we again talked about this pattern, this overall pattern of this violence escalating. And so I bring that back to this slide that I was showing you, um, facing the sort of Russia's intentions of what intent to destroy can mean. It means that we're working um, both in the Holodomor, when we look at that case, and today, of perpetrators who are willing to go to greater systemization and coordination of, for example, who could have diverted grain and saved millions of lives, or who take active military action today to try and harm millions of lives. It means that you will have perpetrators who behave in ways that we think are against their self-interest, um, because they've decided their main interest is destruction. It means that they'll take greater risks, that they'll be inclined to double down. Um, and it also means that, that what they're attempting to do may just kind of boggle the mind. So when we were looking for our, our report that I showed you at the at looking at the what Russia was trying to do with the missile attacks that many of you are familiar with that began last fall and that we may be facing again this winter. Um, we were looking at some of the humanitarian documentation that happened as soon as those missile attacks began before we saw the international aid surge because thankfully, as many of you know, there was an international aid surge. Um, I'm so grateful for that aid, I know we all are. I also want to point out that so many lives um, I know were harmed last year because of what Russia was trying to do. Um, but we were looking at these humanitarian documents before that aid surge began. 
And for example, we had the International Rescue Committee talking about 17.7 million Ukrainians would require humanitarian assistance to survive the winter. Um, and so when we look at um, the, the full scale of what Russia, what it means when you're trying to destroy a national group today, um, facing the extent of that is really important. Facing those perpetrator logics is really important. And again, I think that this was something that Ukrainians themselves were pretty sensitive to. People were talking um, in the language of Kolodomor, so death by cold. Um, so again, just kind of facing these realities of what it means intent to destroy. Um, It'll get a slightly more cheerful, but not yet. Um, so we also need to look at networks. And so I talked again about genocide as such a challenging crime for, for policy responses, because again, it is taking this broad network of trying to stop a broad network. And so I really felt lucky that I went after Daria last year because she did a, a wonderful talk on the kind of rank and file perpetrators during Holodomor. So I don't wanna recover um, a lot of the, the ground. I, I really recommend her speech from last year. But she she went through in great detail about the many institutions that were involved in carrying out Holodomor. And today, of course, we see that as well. And we see people playing distinctive roles. And so we can learn from how um, these kind of past networks work to try and figure out how to disrupt them today. So we look at things like direct perpetrators, whether that's you know taking food during the 1930s or doing some of the direct killing. Or today, we would look at war fighters and soldiers. Or we also look at people who are organizing it. So back then, it would be those who were carrying out and creating the bureaucratic mechanisms who were doing population resettlement in 1933, 1934. Today it would be bureaucrats, occupation authorities, military recruiters, planners, the passport consular advisors, those who are participating in the, the forced trafficking of Ukrainian children and adults. And that's not all. So we also have authorizers, and that's where you get to the level of Stalin and Putin. Um, but they're doing different things to make this mechanism go forward. And then we're also um, looking at enablers. And so here, I think that there are some things that we can kind of draw um, important lessons from and good courage from. So the Soviet Union does not have the informational blockade that it once did. Um, and Ukrainians are very eloquent with expressing their feelings of the war, their experiences of the war. And thankfully, we have the technology to do that. Um, but again, that there's also people in the information space who are working to dehumanize them on the Russian side. And then also just pointing out the critical role of bystanders. This is the sort of painful part of looking at how genocides occur. We kind of know from comparative genocide studies that genocides don't really happen when a crazed lunatic rises in power. That can be part of it. But it really happens when a critical majority of people do not kind of stop or participate with that person rising power in the first place. It's so kind of the hard part of genocide is that it requires a lot of ordinary people just saying nothing. Um, in many cases. Um, and so today, you know, when it's, we're, we're not living in Stalin's totalitarianism, we're, we're living in the modern era. And so that's a question that I, I pose a lot to, to the people of Russia. Um, and so as we go on, I, I wanna just sort of point out outcomes. So, um, you know, I, I will say probably the hard thing first and then some areas for hope. Um, I'm so pleased that Olga um, Andreevsky is here because I wanted to read um, a quote from your work. <laughs> there you are. Um, so with your permission, I'll read it because I think you summarized for us what I think is one of the most eloquent descriptions of some of the terrible loss that we've had um, due to Holodomor, um, which was, I'm quoting, I'm quoting Olga now, in terms of patterns of migration, family structure, religious practices, rituals of courtship and marriage, names and naming practices, in terms of status and ranking, in terms of attitudes towards power, authority, and political participation, in terms of social identity, this period, the Holodomor constitutes a radical break. And so I think your work, um, I've really used it a lot, thank you for it. It talks a lot in great detail about everything that was lost. Um, now, thankfully, you know, Ukraine stands, and it stands strong today, um, but there was many, many things that were lost when, when this process was not stopped. And so that is the kind of the hard outcome, um, but the very clear outcome of genocides is that they do not tend to end in negotiated settlements. I, I haven't really worked a case of genocide where we've seen it just be negotiated away. So it does tend to have a kind of totalizing outcome. Now what I want to point out, and what is very important for me to point out with every conversation I have with Ukrainians, um, is that 
having a genocide waged against you does not automatically make you the loser of that. Um, so groups like in Rwanda that were affiliated with the victim group fought back and won. Um, in other cases, such as during the Holocaust, it was um, with the aid of outside interveners. And so um, when I talk about these outcomes, I am often looking to members of my own country, my own uh, members of my political establishment, and pointing out that, that, um, that this is our role um, in determining this outcome. So um, I do... I do just also want to, to point out that something that has been really kind of eerie and ominous for me um, is working a case with um, the Russian Federation today where history or a version of history is being so willfully manipulated and invoked. You want to be you know, kind of careful as an analyst, um, especially for me as an anthropologist, where we're a little bit sensitive to the stories we tell about history. So not always just looking at exactly the events that happened, but the stories we tell about them. Um, but what we've seen with, with the Russian Federation is a really um, an invocation and a distortion of history and a usage of history to terrorize. And so um, something that for, for audiences that don't follow the Russian media space as closely, um, I like to point out this phrase that it's using, we can repeat or we can do it again, um, is the translation and how that came from um, Soviet graffiti in Germany in 1945 and had this connotation of World War II memory, memorization. But when you look at how that came back into modern Russian pop culture today, it was first appearing on a bumper sticker just before the annexation of Crimea and it became really lewd, I won't go into it, but it was connected and kind of exploded in popularity around Crimea. Um, and so I just want to kind of conclude with pointing out that, that Russia's genocidal war against Ukraine has just kind of willfully and almost eerily reconstructed some of the darkest periods of Ukraine's history. So modern assassination lists of influential Ukrainians, the Black Sea blockades, the mass looting of agricultural equipments, I know remind a lot of us of Holodomor, the nuclear threats, um, remind us, and I think are used willfully to remind us of the 1980s Chernobyl nuclear disaster. Um, but when we see, again, not just the, the usage of, of historical narratives to terrorize, but this kind of brazen confidence that you can get away with it, um, then I don't think I have to tell this room, but what I like to tell bigger audiences, that should make you mad. Like there are some things that are worth um, getting kind of mad about. And one of them is this idea that, that we can move away from, from this era of never again, as imperfect as it was, um, that we can move from having the, the UN Genocide Convention as politicized as it can be, as incomplete as that definitional language can be. It still exists. Um, it still exists and is the foundation of international human rights law today. Um, and so as we, we look at Russia working through both the actions, through both the targeting of the Ukrainian people today, through its terror in other parts of the world, and through its specific invocation of these phrases, um, more is at stake than just the safety of millions of Ukrainians. And that's why this case is so important for us. That's why knowing the history of the Holodomor, staring into these kind of dark episodes of the, of the relationship, and then looking broader, looking at what, what Russia is trying to repeat and this kind of delicate architecture that can collapse with, if their actions are successful is so important. And so, you know, as I conclude, um, I will just end with a line from Moldova's president, Maya Sandu. She delivered a speech and she quoted them. She called out um, this, this Kremlin language and she said, we can do it again? No. Never again? Yes. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up my remarks. Um, this is a way to stay in touch with me. And then also I welcome your questions. We have both an audience here and one in Edmonton, uh, which can pose questions. Uh, I would ask you, uh, yes, to raise hands, and uh, I see already the first hand, but maybe <laughs> I'll just pose one question as uh, before uh, to start us off. Uh, I found it very interesting when you brought up the 2017 quote. But I wonder what was going on in your mind between 2015 and 2017. Mm -hmm. Would you have ever been able to have considered it when you first started? Mm -hmm. And then Russia's when did it change? Uh, and when did you see the whole, the more differently and the situation that was going on so closely connected? Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, so just to make sure I understand the question, um, so was the first question about um, my view of when we might consider Russia's modern genocide beginning? Or when, mm -hmm. when your first study of the whole of the war, mm -hmm. did you see this fully as a genocide in 2015? Mm -hmm. And then how much did the contemporary mm -hmm. situation influence your view of the whole I of see. the war yeah. as well? That's a great question. So for me, um, there was two sort of research aims for me when I first went to Ukraine. The first was to look at the documents, um, and I published a fair amount of technical and dry things on that, um, of looking at these documents. And the way that I approach um, any case of genocide, I just try to keep it really consistent. So consistent in, in different periods of history, consistent in areas of the world. So I have a framework that I use. We use proxy variables that kind of help us to infer intentionality, as we call it. And I use these kind of frameworks with every case um, that I ever work on, just you know, for my own kind of, it's important for that kind of academic integrity to kind of apply it in the same way. And I actually did that first. So um, I was really interested for myself of looking at the case of Holodomor um, and drawing those conclusions. I later published that work. But before I published that work, that's when I began to do this kind of interviewing process that it was important for me to, from my, my view as a comparative genocide scholar, draw my conclusions about what the historical record would show us in light of the way we approach genocide theorizing, and then to kind of hold those cards close to the vest because I wasn't really there um, to um, you know, influence um, Ukrainians. I wanted to know how it felt for them because there are kind of two questions that you ask as a researcher. The first is what's happened, and the second is how does a modern population interpret the past? And those are actually just two different research questions. Thank you. Please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hook, and thanks for everyone who made this lecture possible. Uh, my name is Elena Voynich. I'm a Master of Public Policy student at Monk School. And my question will be about modern time. So there have been a lot of discussions how to hold Russia accountable for their crimes, uh, including International Criminal Court issued mm -hmm. arrest warrant for Putin and several other officials responsible for kidnapping Ukrainian children. But not uh, all Russian criminals can be held accountable through this International Criminal Court mechanism. Mm -hmm. Uh, and most likely they will be held accountable not for genocide, but for a uh, crime of aggression. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is being discussed now is uh, establishment of ad hoc tribunal uh, for these criminals. So have you been involved in these discussions? And if yes, can you please share where we are now? Sure. So the crime of aggression is a leadership crime. So the special tribunal, or you might have seen Eurojust, has set up a special office for the prosecution of aggression. It is a, it's a big thing in, in international criminal law. It hasn't been prosecuted since Nuremberg. I just presented last week, so I don't have those slides with me, but what the crime of aggression is. But again, that's a leadership crime. So a leadership crime of the level of president, prime minister, defense minister, um, secretary of state, at that kind of level of leadership with, for example, atrocity crimes, such as war crimes, those are perpetrators at the kind of individual level. So that would be the 21-year-old sergeant that I talked about. He would not be eligible to be tried for the crime of aggression, but could be tried under something like an atrocity crime. Um, so I am quite bullish on the prospects of, of accountability moving forward, um, that there's a lot of work that's being done. We're all quite active. Um, in this. I would also mention, though, that these are questions of courtroom guilt. And so something that, for example, the report I showed you, we're trying to push the ball forward a little bit and not just to talk about individual guilt of, of um, you know, people who've committed criminal acts. We, in this legal document, also talk about the international law framework for state responsibility. So talking about Russia as a nation state using the resources industry um, of a state to wage this war, that there should also be, um, again, it's not the language of guilt, guilt is for criminal acts, but the language of responsibility in terms of what the nation of Russia will owe the nation of Ukraine. Okay, and do we have an Edmonton question, or yes? You mentioned that genocide importantly includes intent, but as we know from the history, it's usually hard to identify, claim, or emphasize the intent of the oppressor due to their political protection or blindness of political actors at the time. 
So in your opinion, as scholars and students, how do we identify and support proclamation of genocide when we see it happening? And what can we do to support this proclamation and hold of genocide? That's a great, que that's a great question, thank you. Um, so again, we have grappled with this question because it, it's a very good question. How do you understand um, what perpetrators are after you? You obviously can't enter their mind, but you can look very closely at their words. People often, I think, give more away than they realize. And that is a commonality that we see in genocide perpetrators. They're often quite cocky. Um, we see that, for example, with the current Russian president, where um, my, my colleague who participated in this report launch, he talked, um, he was the first US ambassador for war crimes, David Schaefer, and he likes to call Putin um, the self-incriminator in chief. He's never seen somebody self-incriminating on a daily basis like that. For historical records, um, again, it is something that we've grappled with, not just in the case of Holodomor, but we've grappled with in other cases. And so there's been a lot of genocide theory building and theorizing and conceptual frameworks that have been developed around that. We are indebted to the field's origins as Holocaust studies, as well as other cases. So I've myself written on Rwanda, the former Yugoslavia, and others where you look at, um, we call it proxy variables, it's so technical, it's very jargony, but you look at how people talk about their future, you look at the level of systematic coordination you have, you look very closely and for certain things in all of this kind of self-justifying language about how they view the, the victims. And so what genocide scholars in my part of the field would argue is that you can infer intentionality um, according to those lines. And so um, all that to say, I think your question was about how we can um, assess intentionality and then what we should do with proclamations today. So, you know, again, proclamations are, are a, I would say, a kind of um, a political act, but that doesn't mean they're not important. So what I think about working on very controversial topics, very controversial cases, is I sort of wake up in the morning and I say, I should just tell the truth today. What is the truth as best I know? Um, whenever I, I say something, I try to cite it very carefully. I, you know, the, the report that I've been talking about, I think we have something like 300 footnotes, like thank you to the research assistants who did that. Cite your work and tell the truth. And if, um, and if that is reflected in a proclamation, then it's important to use the mechanism of a proclamation to get the truth out there. Argo. First of all, thank you very much, Dr. Hook, for a phenomenal presentation. Um, my name is Marco Robert Stech from Canadian Institute of Ukraine Studies. Um, I have two very short questions, mm -hmm. and, and one is uh, has to do with your categorizing, having five categories of the participants of, of genocide. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the context of discussions of whether this is a Putin's war or it is Russia's war, would you not consider when you include bystanders and enabler, enablers into the categories of participants of genocide, would you not consider the majority of the Russian nation as part of this process? Mm -hmm. This is first uh, question number one. Mm -hmm. And second question is, in the context of the growing discussions of some sort of political deals being done mm -hmm. between various governments, in your opinion, what is the chance that these criminals will get away with mm -hmm. the crime of genocide? Mm -hmm. Thank you, these are great questions. So yeah, that, that's a big part of why, for example, I know probably a lot of people in this room, but I was one of them that was very sensitive and didn't like this language of, of Putin's war because um, war is not a sole endeavor. And as the, the escalation continued and we began to see this kind of pattern of atrocities that I talk about in my work, as I talked about, you know, with this process of genocide, um, also with war crimes and crimes against humanity, these are these are um, these are crimes that take a lot of participation. So they take, you know, finding where um, the people are gathering to send a missile. They take all of these kind of illegal activities, passportization, all of that. It takes a lot of people to get this done. And I think that that is a real indictment about the, the number of people in Russian society who are participating in ways big and small. Um, and then also this process of bystanding. So in other presentations and other work that I write about, I talk about what tends to happen, what we see happen in perpetrator societies. 
And we, we see things that in genocide studies language is called cascading radicalization or moral reorientation. And I, we have seen it happen in Russia. So what tends to happen is, um, you know, in the beginning, so if you think last February, you might see more language on the sort of Russian society side of we have to do this, um, this is unfortunate thing that has to be done, you know, so it's this kind of unfortunate that has to be done. And then over time, like the participation in violence against Ukrainians transformed into an ethical good. So we have to do this for our children and grandchildren. It's a very warped justification of an ethical good, but that's a change from it being a passive, unfortunate thing. Um, and so we do see these kind of transformations happening in Russian society. And that is um, partially for me when we talk about a state responsibility framework, the legal grounding for that. Also as a social scientist, um, what I also am saying to, to Russian society that there are rights and responsibilities of citizenship and there need to be responsibilities in facing what, what Russia as a nation has done to Ukraine. Okay, so okay. we have... An Edmonton question, yeah. Well, no, I have an online question, not from Edmonton. Maybe then we can take one more from this audience then go back to Edmonton. Okay. Uh, Ulyana Pizzamecki asks, you mentioned the targeting of young men and both the brutal reality and symbolism of this. Do you see the same pattern regarding the targeting of children when thinking about the whole of the more genocide continuum? Mm. Could you read the first part of the question? Uh, that we see it, the targeting of young men mm -hmm. and genocide right very often, and do you see that pattern at all in the, in the case of the Holodomor? Right, so actually, unfortunately, I mean, this is a sad reality of, our, of humanity. I often say genocide studies feels a bit like humanity's janitor. It's really doing, like, it's grappling with the worst things we do to each other. But actually, the targeting of young men is something we see in many cases of violence and warfare, not just in genocide. Um, unfortunately, young men are viewed in many cases of warfare as potential threats, and so they are very commonly targeted. Um, so that's not a genocide-specific behavior pattern that we see. Um, when, when looking at genocidal violence, we are looking for evidence that it is not just um, qualified selection of victims, and by that I mean like slices of, of a group, like children or boys. We're actually looking for the way perpetrators talk and the people they try to target as unqualified. So just on the basis of identity alone, no longer a subset of that population, but having the, whatever targeted identity is enough. Um, so we're, it's, it's actually the opposite of what the question was asking. Okay, the question from the back of the room, yes. 10 years ago, uh, you actually uh, organized, <laughs> organized. To the microphone. <coughs> We can't hear you. Put it closer to the microphone or make sure it's on, please. Okay. Okay. Uh, ten years ago, UFT uh, organized an uh, international conference dedicated to the um, eight, uh, eight, 80 years uh, mem commemoration of the Holodomor. And uh, as a conclusion of this international conference, it uh, participated United States uh, scientists, French scientists, and another. Uh, was uh, a strange conclusion that uh, Helen Domar uh, was possible because of uh, Ukraine was uh, in in the frames of the R Russian Empire. <laughs> it was surprising to me, and at the conclusion, I uh, they, they took a word and. Uh, comment that uh, Ukraine was in the, in the frame, in the borders of the Russian Empire uh, more than 300 years. It uh, never was such massacres, uh, 10 million people for the couple okay. years. So, and uh, 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 special uh, research, uh, and I proclaim it about this, uh, uh, concentrated attention that uh, Holodomor was organized uh, by the um, construction of the Second Hazar Empire, uh, started in the 1918, uh, after the so-called Russian Revolution. And uh, at present, now we uh, present in the situation of the construction of the third Hazarian Kaganat. 
But in my opinion, it's uh, not too correct. Uh, How about a question, question please? My question, yes. what, what is your opinion about this? I, uh, oh, Professor Sissin was participated in this session. Uh, he, he can re uh, remember this. Question. Uh, that's, uh, my question is, uh, in, in, I will ask him. In my opinion, uh, we are presented uh, in the situation of the construction of the fourth uh, Hazarian Kaganat. Uh, because it's not a question. This is it, an opinion. It's, it's, my, it's my opinion, but my question. No, no, but you <laughs> ask a question. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah. Wait, wait. All right. I, I think we, we yeah, understand. So, so yeah, in my opinion, uh, second, Hasbarian Kaganat was organized in the Salonika. This is uh, not a question. Yes. Uh, and the uh, Russian Revolution organized the third <coughs> Hasbarian Kaganat. Uh, at present, the Ukrainian government, together with the Russian government, organizes the fourth Hazarian Kaganat. What uh, can you comment situation about the Fetirni uh, by the Arthur Kessler's uh, uh, research and the uh, so invisible Hazaria, uh, the colonel of the armed forces of the Russian uh, uh, army? Uh, uh, okay, I, th I think we have the question. Yeah. So it's a, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, about Khazarian, uh, yeah, we, we have the question, and, and, uh, uh, okay, th th uh, thank you. We have theories of the Khazarian empire uh, re-emerging in history. Of course, Khazarianism is interesting to all of us, uh, particularly in early modern Ukrainian history because of the Khazar mythology of uh, the Cossacks and the time before uh, Orlik's constitution. So in some ways, not Khazarian empire, but at least Khazarianism is important in it. Uh, I don't know if our, our speaker uh, has a view on it, and I don't want to, want to take it away, but I thank you for, for your comment on it and, and views. And with that, I think, do we have another question? Uh, Edmonton. Edmonton. Hello, my name is Cody Mackway. I'm the president of the Ukrainian Student Society at the University of Alberta. Uh, you had mentioned the centrality of the destruction of community and civil society in the imposition of genocide. In what ways can communities respond to these types of attacks and how can students and youth generations work to rebuild these bonds of community? Great question. I'm getting excellent questions tonight. I really appreciate the engagement. So uh, this is an excellent question because it's going to the heart of what genocide is using violence to try and destroy, right? So the process of destroying a group necessarily, as the excellent question expressed, is about destroying those social bonds. And I think the question there, if I'm understanding correctly, is civil society is what we think of these mechanisms and groups and mobilizations within society that work to strengthen those bonds. Um, so I think today we we see so much resiliency in Ukraine, and I think that I have two things to say about that. First of all, I respect it, and I will never forget so many acts of individual bravery as long as I live. And the second thing that I like to say, though, is that um, Ukrainians shouldn't have to express that resiliency every day. So I think we want to... Um, avoid when speaking with international audiences, get them used to this idea that Ukrainians will just be resilient forever and forever and forever. They shouldn't have to. Um, it should also be our role. So the question I got was about what can, I think you said, um, youth, youth engagement do with this. When I think about it, I think about so many of the kind of foundational thinkers of genocide. Um, for example, Raphael Lemkin and his engagement to Lviv during his student days. Or I think about you know my own days of starting out in genocide studies. It was in um, it was in activism for this. So it was during the Darfur genocide and things like that. Um, so I think that youth engagement can play a very powerful role in inviting the world around us to um, engage with our moral conscience when we look at the world around us. So not just to read a news headline um, that might say something dry and technocratic like I talk about, which is the global architecture of human rights, but can help people understand what that means. Um, that that does mean um, you know, protection for individual teenagers or children in Ukraine, that it does mean this kind of 
fostering of Ukrainian civil society and I would say global civil society around of it. These bonds of solidarity are really important. So um, I won't tell you what to do. I think that you probably know what to do um, as that, that youth generation. Um, but we, we really appreciate the work of, of people your age, your generation doing it because I think that brings a lot of the energy to the room that we really need to solve these huge problems. Yes. No any press. Uh, thank you very much for your brilliant talk. Um, and I was particularly enthused to learn that you're, uh, you take you study genocide from the point of view of anthropology, mm -hmm. which you know I've, I've in recent weeks I've learned about that, and also I learned about uh, sociol the sociological approach in particular, Helen Fines. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could uh, say, you know, in general terms, quick terms, uh, draw distinctions between the historical, social, anthropological, and, his, and uh, sociological. Mm -hmm. And also, if you would be interested in speaking to the aspect, the non-physical mm -hmm. aspects of genocide. Great question. Um, so genocide studies has gotten increasingly sophisticated and comparative in its approach. There's um, roles for everyone, I think. And what I like to say when I train my own students is that everyone's work is incredibly important. And I really do believe that a lot of the future of the big questions of the world, like genocide, are about all of these interdisciplinary kind of research clusters of which Herak has a particular talent in convening. Um, so when we look at a case um, like Holodomor, for example, I'm incredibly indebted to the work of historians. We need to know what happens. We need all of the time they spent in the archives um, helping us organize the patterns of what was going on. And then I, I come into it, and as an anthropologist, I look a lot at um, the breakdown of social ties. I look at, as a scholar, a lot of um, having to do with cultural heritage, destruction, and loss. I also look, um, as an anthropologist, I kind of look at genocide as an extreme form of human behavior. And so if there are any other anthropologists in the room, you know that sometimes we have to discuss, um, you know, sometimes anthropologists really like to look very, very deep at one particular context. And we say, can you really compare anything to this particular context? When I speak to my fellow anthropologists, I say, I think we can with genocide. Genocide is so extreme. This this desire to wipe out a group is such an extreme form of human behavior that we can actually draw some comparisons there. Um, when you're looking at people like Helen Fine or sociologists, they have done a lot of the work to talk about group organization. They do a lot with bystanding. How do people behave when they feel they're under threat? Do they stand up for their fellow humans? Do they cower? Um, and then also I'll point out the role of sociologists. So I mentioned moral reorientation that can happen in perpetrator societies. I'm quoting psychologist James Waller there. Um, so really, I think genocide studies now is very interdisciplinary. Everyone kind of bringing to bear a piece of the puzzle. I hope I answered the question. Was there another part of it? Is, okay. um, thank you very much for the wonderful lecture and your answers. Um, I'm just curious as to what you mean by the treatment of people as resources by the modern yeah. Russian state. And if perhaps there are illustrations of that you could bring that are maybe go beyond military recruitment and deployment. Sure. Thank you. So I was actually quoting last year's lecture. So I want to, that was, um, so I'm quoting the work of Daria Mattingly. This was actually something that she talked about at last year's lecture, um, which was talking about this kind of logic of empire wherever it exists. Um, this idea that, that the individual um, loses kind of their inherent dignity, their inherent worth, the fact that they don't have to do anything except exist to have their work. The, the role of empire and colonialism are where people are often treated more as resources. And so I'm doing my best to represent her talk, um, but that's what she was talking about last year. And she, I think, was doing a phenomenal job to kind of grapple with less than um, a year into the full-scale invasion and talking about 
I hope I'm doing it justice, Daria, but talking about the role of, of treating people as resources, of treating them as not having individual rights, of being um, not, not able um, and worthy of charting their own destiny, but to just be subjects of an empire. So, um, but her talk is available online too, if I didn't do it justice. Hi. Yeah, I think we have another question from here and then to this gentleman. We have uh, two online questions that I think that can be taken together. And I'd also like to mention that Daria Mattingly sent an online comment. Uh, I hope you. I'm not in trouble. No, <laughs> she thanks you for your, for your outstanding presentation and for your work that, and says that in spite of the violence and despair of today, your scholarship inspires. And she looks forward to continuing to work together. Okay, so we have two questions. One is from Derek Barker of the Kettering Foundation in Dayton, Ohio. Mm -hmm. He said, thank you for a terrific presentation. I've noticed a tendency in the scholarly literature on the Holodomor to avoid the question of whether it was genocide, mm -hmm. including even by some scholars mentioned tonight. They sidestep the question. Uh, can say that it fits into a broad understanding of genocide, but not the legal. What do you hope to achieve by greater recognition of Holodomor, specifically as a genocide? And this may or may not connect to this other question. What are the key points or characteristics that need to be taught in schools globally for the prevention of future genocides? Great question. Um, so a few things I've noticed. I have noticed uh, that, that sometimes I think, because we're all kind of busy doing our own thing, that there can be, unfortunately, sometimes a siloing effect. So you had, for a long time, um, I think, comparative genocide studies had some people who were engaged on Ukraine or Stalin, but perhaps not a lot. And that's a part of the field that I think is growing now that I'm really excited about. But I think what that led to is, um, the need to now bring some of the conversations that genocide studies as an academic field is really comfortable with to bring those into um, some of the brilliant sort of historical reconstructions of the Holodomor. It's already happening, but for example, to, to say, you know, um, yes, there's a legal definition, but we as a field have moved quite beyond that. Um, so we've grappled with the fact that it was a political product. We've looked at you know, who should be protected as groups, or we've looked at differences between what's called hard law or soft law applications, um, that we've come up with ways to infer intentionality, not just in one case, but to kind of do it in a academically fair, consistent way across the board. Um, and so I think that sometimes scholars from both fields just need to have more conferences like we had in 2018 and to say that there's been quite a lot of theory building since 1948, fortunately. Um, and so those questions can come in. Can you remind me of the second question? Oh, it was about global education. And what needs to be taught in schools that will contribute to prevention of genocide? Yeah. Um, I, I think I will just speak personally. Um, so I think that I, I abhor genocide, and yet I also think that it humbles, it humbles people who are willing to look at it as a human process. And so um, as much as I try to speak really clearly about um, what I see happening with the Russian state and with Russian society today, for me, um, as a citizen in my own country, it's made me think we need to be willing as a citizen of my country to have hard conversations because that doesn't seem to have happened in Russian society and some of these prejudices have kind of blossomed. And so instead of just sitting around pointing fingers, like there's a role for accountability, but there's also a role for looking inward. Um, and so I think for, for learning about genocide, um, it's this idea that that bystanding is really important, that speaking up when we see um, wrongs, it's, it's really kind of this basic human behavior of, of um, standing together when people try to divide or um, just sort of refusing any type of, of um, willingness to, to deny people human rights or to attack parts of their identity. I think it's really the basic things that um, that we're just taught about being good citizens in the world really matter. It says individual human actions really matter for, for preventing genocide today. Now, I have uh, one more question. Before that, I will mention, since schools have come up, uh, that we have uh, these pamphlets. We hope you will buy books, but you have a free pamphlet you can get, uh, which deals with Holodomor Memorial Day in schools. Fantastic. And uh, please uh, pick that up and distribute it further. And here, this gentleman, please. And then. Oh, I thought we. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Christina Hook, uh, 
that that was a really an informative presentation. I like some of your breaking down in layers. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things is the fact that uh, genocide has happened, all those debates, and it comes back to maybe with some of the questions I've dealt with, in particular last week, I really think so much boils down to the human condition. It is human beings on those, that array of categories you listed, that participate by decisions and decisions of action and so-called inaction, which is an action. And uh, I, I see this pervading not just so much on the genocide level, mm -hmm. on multiple levels in society, in our country dealing with uh, the vaccines and mandates, among other different things. We got some immigration uh, tensions going on right now because of large numbers and us. And I see this issue coming again and again, and that ease to do finger pointing, mm -hmm. but also the need to have constructive conversations about difficult subjects needs to be done. Regarding maybe my question, yeah. dealing with the element of Russia, I think of the Vietnam War, eventually those 50,000 plus Americans who came back dead mm -hmm. and those injured, eventually accumulated as part of the reason for America to change its decision. It strikes me Russia is gonna be dealing with some of that as well. And what do you feel can be some of the practical ways that Russians can participate, review? Those are you know, if I can say it as a non-Slav, brother Slavs, they were part of a union of Soviet social republics. Is there something in Russian society that they can participate in their own inner reflection you talk about? Mm -hmm. That are there practical ways to deal with those are Russians coming back dead and injured? Any thoughts on that, that how Russians themselves can do that? Yeah, so I think at the heart of your question is about reconciliation and what that might look like going forward. And the way I like to start off this conversation is saying that we can talk about reconciliation much more fruitfully when Ukrainian security is guaranteed and secured. And so, um, first of all, our focus needs to be making Russia's ongoing genocide stop, um, that the central duty and the legal obligation is prevention of what is going on today. Um, as, so as we move forward into a future where Ukraine is safe and free, um, I, I think a lot about, you know, in my field, so a little bit broader than genocide studies is peace studies and conflict resolution, and that's where I teach. And we kind of had to reckon with the fact that, you know, conflict resolution was seen as papering over these really challenging dynamics in human relationships. And so there have been some scholars um, like John Paul Lederach that proposed conflict transformation. And it's harder because you have to go to those deep root issues. You have to go to things like historical chauvinism or why that joke is popular in society or what it means. Um, and it requires looking at those deep historical dynamics. And so I think that that will be, um, I hope, for, for the, the sake of Russia, that, that society is able to grapple with what they've done. I think I was also asked a question that I didn't fully answer, so I'll tack it on here about accountability. And you know, I like to say a couple of things. So first of all, it's important, it's very important, and I work a lot with lawyers now to get these crimes in a court of law. But that's not the full story. And you know, I'm not sure if my audience here has heard of one of our most notorious American gangsters, Al Capone. But he was a gangster. He did a lot of crimes. You can read lots of biographies on all the crimes he did. If you look at his courtroom record, he's a tax fraud. That's not quite the whole story, right? And so as much as the courtroom system has to be grounded in the truth, it's not the full arbiter of truth. Um, and that's where research and others and people in this room um, also will bring to bear the reality of what's happened. And so when I think I'm bringing this back, I have a point connected to this question. When I'm, when I'm thinking about the future of reconciliation, I think that it will, need, it will need to be important for Ukrainian society to kind of reckon with when, when people are ready, the fact that their neighbor was not just trying to change their government, but was actually trying to destroy their way of being. But that's also going to be very important for Russian society to face the reality um, that, again, this wasn't a territorial skirmish, but that this was um, a very violent attempt at destruction of their neighbor. Oh, thank you so much for your attention tonight and for coming out. I want to thank our speaker for a really brilliant talk. Again, our, I'd like to thank the co-sponsors and our Edmonton audience, and we invite you for a simple reception, and I'm sure our speaker would be pleased to answer more questions informally. Thanks again for coming.